Okay. I was very much inspired by your purple house. So when I went to change the colors on my house, I took a Frida Kahlo book, an art book, to Sherwin Williams, and I said, "I want Casa Azul," wow. and that's what I picked as my colors. Would you just kind of share with us the joy of living someplace where the colors? color every single day because they are vibrant and right. they just add something every single day that you are in your household. Oh, what a nice question. Well, you know, one of the things I learned is uh, people don't like you to be happy. You know? <laughs> like if you paint your house a Boy, happy is that color, true? I agree you know, with they that. get really upset. Yeah. But I think it's people who aren't happy that make all the ruckus, don't you think? You know, because I had a lot of people in my neighborhood that started putting purple ribbons in support. Right. Of the purple. So can we tell you, you're, you're, go you're gone from there. Yeah, right? but my house got repainted. I right. painted it So this was in the King William and now it's purple again. neighborhood of San Antonio. And I honestly think that it's purple again. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, that's news. Yeah, that's they, right, the seriously? people that bought it painted it purple. And are they complaining again about the No, purple? they got a divorce. <laughs> oh, oh, I meant the neighborhood complaining. Oh, I don't know. I don't because live that, there because anymore. my memory is that when you did this, this was a it was yeah. A scandal, I was just I was right? just trying to make it a color that was happy. Right. Well, it definitely stood out. If yeah, but to find but you know, house, they but now it. I live in a in a very modest house that is a color I would never pick, like a, a ice cream bar chocolate, hmm. and uh, it was that color when I bought it. And it's in the historic district, and all the colors in San Miguel are either like a reddish brown or ochre. I don't know how they stretched it to chocolate, but it's basically earth colors. Uh, however, inside I got to do colors. So no, I bet you do. Yeah. And honestly, if you read when you read this, you will uh, the the very vivid uh, description of the house they live in and the color. I mean, I think in fact Casa Azul comes out and. Yeah, I, I had to. I had. So many clues that it who it was. Right. I was surprised, but I added Coyoacan and a little added, bit more to, to Koyukan, help right. to help readers. Right. Yes. Good. Hi. Hello. Um, this has probably been asked, but uh, what kind of inspired the theme of growing up in House on Mongo Street? Well, I was actually uh, haunted by my neighborhood when I was in graduate school because I felt the class difference between myself and my classmates. I felt like I didn't have the advantages they had and what was I doing there? I should just quit. I'm not smart enough. You know, the thing you get when you feel different. And I remember um, staying in bed for two days and then I got mad. And once you get mad, you start thinking, well, why hasn't, why haven't I seen my book, my house in a book or in a movie or in a newspaper written with love? And so what I did is I started writing something that was uniquely mine that no one else in the workshop could write. And that's how it began. And if you look at the introduction, it'll take you through a long journey of how it changed when I became a teacher. But thank you for asking that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hello. I was... Um in your book, did you um, base the three old woman off of the um, the house on Mango Street? Did you base the three old woman off of the three pates that appear in Greek mythology? When I was in Greece, I dreamt the first couple of lines of the three women, and of course, being in Greece, I thought about the three fates. Uh, but I was uh, led. The story leads you. You know, you don't think of the symbols; it leads you to symbols, just like when you dream. You know, you don't go to bed and say, I'm going to dream about the three fates. You just dream about three old women, you know, and then you wake up and someone who's smarter than you tells you what you meant, right? <laughs> so yes. that's how I write it. I'm dreaming. It takes, I'm dreaming with my eyes open. I might start with a dream when I was asleep. And then you, the reader, will tell me what I meant, like, like if you were the wise bruja. Okay? <laughs> Thank the wise you. Bruja would be a good name of a book. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you based the character Nenny off your ideal sister, what, like, who, what your ideal sister would be. Oh, I didn't have a sister growing up. My sister died when she was a baby, uh, but I had my cousin Licha, and Licha and her sister Rita would always spend the nights with me on weekends when we could beg to get them to come over. And I missed women's company, so they were very important in my growing up. Uh, originally, when I began House on Mongo Street, Licha was the character. And maybe I didn't use her name. Uh, she, may, she may not have had a name in the beginning. And then eventually it became Nenny. But Nenny was a 
probably a composite of all my friends and their little sisters that had to tag along and spy on us, you know? <laughs> so we were always annoyed by a little sister having to come along. Hmm. And so I shifted the love that I had for my cousins to uh, aggravation, uh, you know, my friends and their little sisters that were, they were dragging along, so, okay? So I don't know what it is to have a sister, but I have lots of friends who are like my sisters. Good. Thank you. Would all of you students come back every time and ask questions? <laughs> I'm very charmed by this. Go ahead. So at the end of the house on Mongo Street, Esperanza talks about coming back. Mm -hmm. Have you in some way come back to your own Mongo Street? Well, uh, look at that question. Let huh? me tell you, when I That's wrote a four the book, star question right there. when I wrote the book, I had no idea that people were going to mistake me for the uh, protagonist. That's kind of, you know, goofy of me, you know, to not have seen that. But I didn't know how to write a character who was a pre-med student. So of course, I made her a creative artist, not knowing that what was going to happen decades later. Um, I was trying in my 20s to find my direction. I wasn't a feminist or a Marxist or an anarchist or any ist, and I was working with all of the above in the school that I worked with. I was just uh, an artsy-fartsy, they called me. <laughs> and uh, you know, I felt lost. I was looking for my politics. So uh, by the time I finished the book, which was not in the order that you've read it, I, I was searching. And one of the things I thought was that people need to be responsible for the uh, problems in their community. We can't expect the mayor to do it. We have to take care of it ourselves, especially communities that are forgotten. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know what ism I am. Uh, I know I'm a feminist, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I tried to bring that message among many others in the story for others. Uh, have I followed it? I guess I have. But it's for you to follow yeah. too. And your Mongo Street is not my Mongo Street. Mm -hmm. Thank Good. you. You're welcome. Excellent. I think we have, you, Steve, you're telling me two more. I'm very okay. sorry that we only and have time any, for two. And anyone who doesn't get to uh, me, we, I'll, I'll stay a little bit and we can chat. Okay? So don't Thank be you. sad. Okay. <laughs> Ma'am. Hi. Um, your writing style in House on Mongo Street is so similar to poetry, and you mentioned that you studied poetry for a while. Yes. Um, so how did you adapt that into your writing style? Well, you know, I was always fascinated by books who were fusion of the two. And uh, so I was influenced by Dream Tigers by Jorge Luis Borges, a fiction writer and a poet. And so I was trying to experiment and write a new kind of fiction that you could open it at any page, just read one, or you could read it from left to right and yep. as a story cycle. I didn't know there were other books that did that. I thought I was inventing it. And uh, so <laughs> I, I, as a poet, um, I'm always listening and paying attention to the unit of the syllable to create a rhythm. And uh, I just couldn't help to do that because I love poetry. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Um, first of all, I just really want to thank you because your novel really changed my life. Um, being from the border, I always identified being Mexican and not really American. And the first time I read your novel as a teacher, I um, felt, oh my god, I'm a Chicana. <laughs> and it was so enlightening. Um, so my question is, this is my 10th year teaching House on Mango Street to ninth graders um, in El Paso, Texas, and I would um, like to ask you for some advice and what you think I should focus on to make sure that I make the most impact on my students. Wow, oh, what a great question. First, thank you for being a teacher because you're in a position where you can influence so many people. Uh, I hope that you have opportunities to be uh, uh, liberal in the selection because sometimes you're fixed with certain programs and you're not allowed to teach everything you like but there's so many good writers that are coming out so many Latina writers that are coming out so many uh, wonderful books by men and women of all races and one of the great things that I'm understanding now you know I don't have to just read books by Latinas I can read that Sri Lankan writer and uh, that Taiwanese writer all of the world is telling us stories that are can speak to us and transform us but it's especially important to allow uh, young readers to see themselves first you know that's how you begin and um, I, I love uh, Cristina Granados from El Paso. She's a great writer. She's a Texas voice that uh, hasn't been given enough attention. Uh, I love this new book that came out, The Air You Breathe, by a Brazilian writer named Francis de Pontes Peebles. The Air You Breathe. I put it on my Instagram page. You know, you, you, I, I realized if you put a book on Instagram, 
that's good. But put a book in a and, dog, and you get lots of likes. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. It's like always, about, it's always yeah. about the dog. Huh? Yeah, you got it. I don't know why. If you put a little dog in a book, you'll get just thousands of likes. Right. So I'm always uh, posting books that I'm reading. And, you know, books are medicine. So this is my prescription. It might not work for you and your students. Find what you're passionate about. That passion is contagious, and your students, you know, they might not say this is my favorite book, but it'll lead them to their prescription. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, Christine Thank you. Granato, uh, that's a good suggestion. She's I love, great. I love that suggestion. Great, okay, we'll, yeah. we'll take the last question. Yeah. Then. Yes. Um, so earlier you talked a little bit about like the misconception of um, how artwork comes to be and how House on Mongo Street came to be and uh, just when you sat down to write it, it was a day you didn't really feel like writing. And I'm sure lots of artists and creative individuals can relate. So I just wanted to learn more about just your process to stay disciplined and motivated. You know, I'm not one of those writers. I'm not going to lie to you and say I write every day. I don't write every day. But when I do write, I try not to put on my shoes. Uh, my Fitbit has, you know, very few steps on the days that I write, unfortunately. And I try to stay home. I try not to talk on the days that I write. I try not to see people till after sunset. Uh, my, um, I wake up at the crack of 9 a.m. And uh, I, I get to work at 1 p.m. And I try to work till sunset. You know, that's like my... Uh, re recess bell. I'm finally done. Yeah. And uh, I try not to see too many people on, when I'm working on a project because even if you see people after the day is done, it affects the next day. You know, so I try to keep um, my social life a little bit small when I'm writing. And I don't, I have periods when I'm writing fiction and I have p periods when I'm trying to revive a 20 year old story or a 10 year old story. I have seasons when I'm working on textiles and text because that's a new field or collaborating with Derek Bermel on a Mango Street opera uh, or working with other artists in other fields. I'm always kind of looking to push uh, the boundaries of what I'm always a border crosser because I think that that allows me a new way of right. thinking and I hope uh, reaching new audiences. And you work on many things as you say at once. Yes. Spinning all those plates. All those plates. There they go. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Good. all at Thank the same you. time. Thanks. It has been such a treat to have Sandra Cisneros here. It really has been. And please give her a big hand again. And thank you for being here.